so let's talk just a little bit. So on this slide here, we're talking about the norms. Um, so sometimes when we have Zoom meetings, we have uh, background noise and things like that. We ask that if you don't mind, if you'll just mute your microphone uh, as we go along, but feel free at any time to pause pause us or to jump in and ask questions and be part of the discussion. Our conversation today is going to be around high leverage practices and special education. And so I want you guys to be able to stop and, and have conversation with us, to have your input, to share some learning and, um, and just be engaged in the conversation. So at any time, just feel free to jump right in. So Denny, if you don't care to advance to the next slide, we'll go ahead and kind of get started. If you had trouble getting signed in, we'll make sure we get you signed in. So for those of you that are here today, we have this trifold for, um, and it's around the high leverage practices in special education. And it kind of just gives us an overview. And for those of you that will participate, we, that are participating today, we'll get a copy of this one as well. And then as the Google Classroom that we shared with you, there's a copy of that and a digital copy of the high leverage practices in special education. And this is an excellent resource tool for you to use um, as you support special education teachers. If you, have, if you have new special education teachers and if you have, um, if, as far as coaching them and if they're, especially if they're brand new from their, um, a new hired special education teacher in the program, it just helps support some of that pedagogical thinking and uh, practices. So if you'll see, so that's what the work is going to be around for this particular session. And it is, um, you know, it is for teachers to understand the high leverage practices is it's just critical for them. And so this one we'll talk a little bit, Danny, if you'll flip to the next slide, I'll talk to you just a little bit about where those ideas came from around the high leverage practices. Let's see. Um, well, let's see, just go back one, I guess, Danny, I'm sorry, it must not be. So um, the CEDAR Foundation is a foundation that is um, around education development, and so it's around uh, accountability, and so that's more of that prep programs, and then we have the Council for Exceptional Children who have special education standards, and so around those standards, that's how this work came about. It was... Um, you know, thinking about what are those high leverage practices. So when they look at the standards, the CEC standards for special educators, and then those practices that they need to know, that's why they created this tool uh, for us to use. And so this particular one is to help um, school leaders. And it's important, again, like I said, for coaching and, and helping them along their professional development and, and supporting them um, throughout the school year. So uh, does anybody have any questions or uh, anybody want to have any comments how, if you're familiar with these tool or uh, if anybody wants to share what they already know about those high leverage practices in special education? For those of you that were able to kind of preview that tool that I shared with you um, on Friday, that, that the digital copy of the um, high leverage practices, you may have already been able to go back and look through that and see that it's really broken down into four components. It's around collaboration and then assessment, social and emotional, and then instruction. So for today, we may move a little more quickly through the collaboration piece because um, I'd like to spend some time talking about assessment and the social, emotional, and behavioral supports, and then the instruction. So as we move through, we'll kind of move a little more quickly through that part. But if you have any questions or, or comments at any time, just feel free to stop me. This PowerPoint will be uploaded in that Google Drive and then I can email you that as well because there's some links that I want you guys to be able to view uh, from this PowerPoint presentation as we move through this one. It's just some resources and supports along the way. But let's take a look, Dan, if you'll click to the next slide then please. And we'll, let's talk about those first three. So there are 22 high leverage practices and those high leverage practices um, are broken down into those four areas. And so the first three are under the component of collaboration. And under collaboration, this one is just talking about those three, that's collaborating with professionals, um, organizing and facilitating effective meetings, and that is collaborating with both the families and prof other professionals. And then how we work with professionals like related service providers, uh, we may work with community mental health uh, folks, but how do, what, how do we work with those folks in order to make sure that we have the services that students need? So the first practice, the high leverage practice, is talking about how we collaborate with professionals to increase student success. And so part of that collaboration is with our colleagues at school. And that would be, might include co-teaching, 
uh, and also paraprofessionals. But we also have other folks that we work with. Like I said, we have some folks that we have like, um, besides we have uh, related service providers. We have, sometimes we have school-based nurses that we collaborate with or because we have students that have medication. We have um, related service, you know, we have occupational therapists or physical therapists that we collaborate with. So that's really a real thing. What, just that we support new teachers and that those practices are that we focus on that collaboration. So the high leverage practice number two is um, really about that special education teacher being able to facilitate and lead IEP team meetings. And so they have to have knowledge about evaluations. They have to be able to look at a student's strengths and weaknesses, areas of concern, and be able to, to use that information to develop a goal for, for a student and then decide what kind of services this child might need and how we place them, what accommodations and modifications. And again, the special ed teacher needs to be the facilitator of that learning. Okay, Denny. And then the third one is around just communicating and working with uh, teachers and families. Now, recently we have uh, developed a micro-credential around um, those collaborative partnerships and how we have special ed teachers who um, can collaborate with like a hearing impaired teacher, for instance. And so there's a micro-credential around that, around those high leverage practices in collaboration. So that one's uh, something that's just recently happened here at KVEC, but that one is a good tool. But it is good that um, our educators understand those, those, how important those collaborations are. And like I said, we're going to spend a little more time here in the assessment and the social emotional and then in the, the instruction. Um, so an assessment has three area, three high leverage practices. And the, the number four is around data and using that, using multiple sources of information. Uh, number five is how we communicate those, how we interpret and communicate those, and then how we use that data. So let's take a look then um, at high leverage practice number four specifically. So this one is really that we, uh, high leverage practice here is that we want um, teachers to use multiple sources of information. So understanding both formal and informal assessment is a critical role for a uh, special education teacher. And we know this if we think about that continuous improvement cycle of teaching and learning, and it's particularly important for students with disabilities because we have diagnostic assessments. We have some formal assessments. We may have, you know, like the Woodcock Johnson or the WISC. Um, we have some adaptive scales. So we have all of these formal uh, assessments that we use for to identify um, the eligibility for a student with a disability. But we have to be able to not only do understand and interpret that data, but we also have to be able to use that informal assessment. So how, do, how are teachers using not just that data, but they also have to use data from, um, you know, maybe they have some uh, map assessments or they use even more assessment to drill down assessments like some screeners. And so, um, so the goal, the role of the special educators really to take that diagnostic assessments and all of these pieces of informal assessment, we may even have anecdotal notes, and be able to use that to compile kind of a profile for a student. Um, and so this, this is kind of just gives you an example. It's that continuous cycle that we use, um, you know, we, tie, we look what, at what kind of data that we have and we try to figure out what's missing. Uh, if there's any pieces of data that's missing. We may have diagnostic data, but that data um, doesn't have some informal data, or we don't know, really, we can't drill down and know what a reading level or a grade level a kid might be on. So we use that, and then we collect that information, and that's how we use that to personalize instruction. Dion, I might add right here that, um, you know, when you are um, in the classroom and you have high levels of engagement, uh, and you are providing uh, opportunities for students to practice. Um, the, you should have uh, informal uh, assessment going on um, almost continuously. And uh, that provides you uh, with a lot of data for decision making and where the child needs to go next. So I just wanted to throw that okay. in there. Thank you. Really around that was just talking about that role of a special educator. And again, we're just trying to kind of clarifying mm -hmm what that role is for that special education teacher and that's and reason we're doing that is just so again we can help you to support that special ed teacher and really clearly understand and kind of define what that role is um so this around this next practice number five it's around um 
you know, why do we, use, what's the purpose of our assessment information? Why do we use that? And then what's that role, that special educator in that process? And so we'd have the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that says, you know, part of uh, deciding if a student has a disability, they have to meet these eligibility requirements. And through that, um, we have, um, you know, those federal regulations. And so we make those decisions about eligibility and then we use that to make, um, then we define where kids present level performance is at so that we know how to meet that individual student and then move them forward. And in that process, the special ed teacher really should be able to interpret the results of an assessment and then they have to be able to communicate that re assessment results to uh, the IEP team, um, and to the general ed teachers uh, and, and you as ARC chairpersons, administrators, and then also with parents and caregivers. So really that's the role of the, in assessment for a special ed teacher is really understand that assessment that really gives us a picture of that student and then be able to transfer that in, then we're gonna create a, an, a, like this profile and then transfer that into writing a goal for a student with a disability. That's one of the things that we see uh, when we review files uh, across the region, um, and we would encourage uh, administrators to make sure that you're checking the present level's performance to see that the baseline is well established around these uh, discrete skills. Um, and that really gives you uh, measurable statements in your present levels, uh, and, and you, you work with measurable uh, verbs. Um, uh, behaviors that you can see, that you can hear, that you can count, you can time. And when you, uh, when you look at that baseline, then that gives you a, a good starting point and a good foundation to your present level and to your IP. And it really drives um, your special design instruction decisions and what you can do uh, for students in terms of trying to close that gap between expected similar age performance and exactly where they are. And that's really where you, you come into seeing that adverse effect on their educational performance and uh, how their disabilities playing in there. Um, now we'll take a look at high leverage practice number six. And again, you'll see this graphic here that just talks about that continuous cycle that we um, can use students present level. Um, we set a goal for them. We choose what interventions and instruction would support the learning of that goal and support student learning. We monitor the progress. We look at that, it's the same thing as that continuous teaching and learning cycle that we use all the time. But helping teachers and, and special educators to understand that around, it's around the IEP goals and objectives. Uh, sometimes that is, it's a little different than, you know, that instruction, that day-to-day -day instruction that we see every day uh, in terms of monitoring an IEP goal. Now, students are still expected to participate in that, you know, be exposed and, and participate in that general education instruction and the curriculum, but this we're talking about looking specifically at that IEP goal and how, because teachers sometimes need some support around thinking about how do they integrate that in, how do they you know, figure out what that child might need and then how, do that, how does that work in collaboration with um, what's going on in the general ed classroom? How do we monitor that? But this gives them that idea or that framework for that continuous improvement cycle. Again, this is around thinking about that in terms of a student's, um, an individual student. And so we think about that because we may have, you know, 20 kids on a caseload that we may have 20 different students who have individual needs that we are doing this continuous cycle of improvement for them as we you know, think through that goal. You know, Dion, I was gonna to add too, I'm glad you have uh, the slide that you do there with uh, set an ambitious goal. Uh, uh, you know, we're operating now under uh, the rally um, implication of the rally case. Um, and uh, that has also led to uh, just recently the Andrew F case, which uh, has pushed us uh, to really consider the unique uh, circumstances of each child and to set ambitious goals for those, for those children, really meet them where they are in light of their unique circumstances that we have an individualized plan. And uh, one of the things that we see, and one of the things that we would encourage in administrators to do is you're looking through your plans and you're, you're overseeing the, the, the ARC meetings, that you would certainly uh, be looking to see that those goals are while they're uh, rooted in the standards, they're not just a repeat of the standards and they are um, certainly um, unique to that particular student's um, unique circumstances. So, uh, and that the goals are challenging um, in view of where they are. Uh, so, uh, you know, you wouldn't wanna have um, uh, a caseload with uh, 
15 students and have every goal exactly the same. You have to be careful not to uh, copy and paste standard language into those goals and make sure that those goals are challenging for each student and uh, effective in meeting them where they are. Thank you, Dave. So that kind of that kind of just took us through those high leverage practices around assessment, and it's really um, just to kind of to synthesize that it's just really about special educators need to use um, data, formal and informal data, um, to make decisions about where a child is is performing at, and then how you monitor that progress. So that's all that continuous improvement cycle. So then let's go to talking about uh, the social emotional. And I, th I think that's something that's gonna be very, very um, important for us upcoming, because I think we're gonna have uh, more uh, conversations around that social emotional and behavioral supports for students, uh, especially in light of where we have been uh, with COVID and, it, and as we are thinking about coming back, how we're gonna reenter school and, and supporting that. But, um, so we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about that social emotional learning, just looking at those classroom learning environments, how we provide feedback, how we teach students those things, and then how we do assessments around behavior to support our students with disabilities. And if you don't care, please click that next slide. So um, around high leverage practice number seven, that one we want to look at those consistent, organized, and respectful learning environments. And so really that's around those two things, which is classroom expectations and classroom procedures. And just to share with you, um, we have a new and emerging special education teacher cadre that we, we do each month here at KVEC to support those new special educators or those um, educators that's five years or less. And so our May meeting was around uh, the first days of school in the work around Harry Wong and the effective teacher. And so we had 25 participants or so, and they were all really engaged around understanding how to build those classroom expectations and classroom procedures. So even though they'd worked through this year and some of them were very you know, new, this was their first year, there were lots and lots of questions around how do you establish those procedures and those expectations. And Denny, can you click on that first days of school link there? Do you see it there in blue? If you, see if that will work for you to share with us. But um, so these are some resources and you will have this PowerPoint with the links as well so that you can uh, share this with your teachers. And you can use this, um, you know, if you're working with special ed teachers, they can use some of this work in their PLCs. Uh, also just to help them grow professionally because I think that's another thing is that if we can uh, have some real tailored or specific things to support special ed teachers but these are really good practices for all teachers will that work Danny doesn't seem to be working okay. um, I was trying to well I'll, I'll show you guys uh, um, I'll, I'll go and show you guys uh, in just a minute from another computer when we uh, get to the end where the references are I will share that one with you the other thing around uh, the social emotional is just feedback for students. And so um, thinking about and, and supporting teachers, because if we, if we come, if teachers come to us and they are, they don't have uh, the background in some of those uh, practices, uh, classroom management, those kinds of things, because we do have new special education teachers who, um, have alternative means or emergency or probationary certification and so as universities are building those programs to better meet the needs of educators we still have some gaps and sometimes so teachers may have some gaps so understanding things like classroom management procedures and those kinds of things and again we'll share those resources with you so that you could provide those you could share that with your teachers uh, even as school goes back as, and as they are working you know as you're planning for this upcoming year and um, thinking about some professional learning opportunities specific to special education teachers, that would be an opportunity. Um, and, but it's really good stuff for all teachers. But um, so the other, so the biggest thing is, you know, figuring out how those routines and procedures and how we pre-teach a lot of those skills and how we um, model those things that we want students to do. And then the, around this one, then high leverage practice number eight is the feedback. And how do we use feedback? And so we use feedback in a way to teach students rather than as a punishment. And so um, that's why it's really important that we model behaviors that we want kids to exhibit. And we're talking right now and specifically with this practice around behavior. Um, we want kids to be able to be um, 
have some specific and, and positive feedback about things that are going well with their behavior or response to um, how, how their classroom, for, for, uh, their following procedures and that kind of thing. And then we want to have opportunities then that, because we think about that in terms of as adult learners, that we also want some professional learning opportunities that we can give feedback for teachers around those things about how are we doing with student behavior, what supports might we need around behavior. So does anybody have any questions at this point? Because I know behavior is a big topic. And when we looked at regionally, some of the needs for special education, behavior was a big issue for us across the region and actually across the state. Behavior is, a, a, is something that you know we um, are consistently seeing. People are wanting more information about um, practices and procedures and um, strategies for dealing with behaviors and what that looks like at tier one, tier two, and tier three. So does anyone have any specific questions or comments at this time? I'm just going to pause right there to see. Dion, I think at Highland Turner, that is um, like not really, we just wanted those strategies to use to be able to say for our Avery work um, for our tier two and have a clear path that I can share with my teachers as far as um, saying here's strategies to try for tier two kids and here's how we know that they are tier two students mm -hmm. and then the same with tier three so that's kind of where um what we've had conversations around at highland turner mm -hmm. that's good um, yeah and i uh, that's that's yes um I think that's exactly where we're at because that's what we hear a lot from special education teachers. You know, we, this is what we're doing here. This what what does it look at tier one and what does that look like? And then, and then, then how do you know? We, you know, at what point do you advance to tier two? What does that look like? How do you record that? Because that's really relevant also if we're thinking about our referral process. Or you may have students who are in the RTI program and it may be around behavior. So I think that's something we certainly could look some more at. We have. Um, built this uh, Google Classroom for those of you that were able to join with resources in there. But before we end today, I will share with you guys some resources that we have to support behavior, but we also can um, uh, help with that. Uh, Doug Smith at KVEC does a good job with um, doing a tiered model for behavior supports mm -hmm. that he could share with you. And, and then he works uh, in conjunction with Kentucky Avery as well, but that's a good point. Thank you. Anyone else want to talk a little bit about that around the behavior? or about a need or priority need. And that kind of helps us frame up the work that we're doing, you know, to help support that. I feel like at Allen, uh, we've got a much better grasp on the academic side than we do the behavior side. We have more resources, we're very fluid with the process that we use, but I find ourselves, especially in our, in our uh, SIT team meetings, you know, when we're talking about behavior, that we have, we have hard time establishing you know, this is level two, this is level three, a screeners, like a behavior screener, just, just mm -hmm. resources in general. I, I just feel like we are mountains ahead yeah. and, you know, we can write a behavior plan. We can implement a behavior plan. We can, we can uh, monitor its progress. You know, we can do those types of things, but specific strategies, I think our teachers are just lacking in strategies and resources and that confident to move the kids through the, mm -hmm. you know, we just do it so commonly with academics, but we, I, I just see us struggling with the academic side of it. And I feel like it's that clear model mm -hmm. and resources. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a really good point. Uh, on this page, um, I'm afraid we might not be able to link it here, but at the bottom of this page, you'll see that there's the Castle Social Emotional Learning, and that is an excellent tool. It's a resource around that social emotional learning, and it provides some uh, insight about different uh, different levels of intervention, um, different skills, some resources. And I will take you to that guys. I don't know if, it'll, if we can get it to work right now, but in the, I'll show you guys that resource, but you're right. So when we finish today, I will also share with you the resource that we have uh, at on the holler here at KVEC around that. And there's links to all of those tools as well. So um, I'll share that with you, but you're right about that. And that helps us to think about that focus because I think behavior is, um, is consistently an issue for people. I do think you're, uh, Rachel, that 
we have really gotten to understand those tiered levels for the academic, but behavior is something that we, um, and if that's something you guys would want, you know, Doug Smith does a great training and he could even do that sometime for administrators, just helping to kind of think about that and then put some resources and some tools that you could share with teachers to use. Because if you've got a kid that's being referred and they're not in special education program, but they're in that RTI, they're in that uh, referral process, those kids need interventions and we need to know what interventions to use and then and then how to document that and then to switch strategies if that if something that we're using with the students not working after so many data points we need to switch that strategy and that would help them with that but that's certainly something we can uh, spend some more time on uh, you know we will do that today and I'll just put those resources in there for you guys and then um, but if there's anything you need for us at your own district as well or, or at your school level you can let us know and we can happy to do some trainings around that too and support that if you all need that. Dion, there's yes. a couple of free resources if these folks are interested on social and emotional learning. One is a K through six uh, resource called Sanford Harmony. Yeah. Sign up, it's free. It's got social emotional learning or lessons and, and things like that in it that is absolutely free, no cost at all. It's uh, pretty much scripted, tells you what you need to say, tells you what materials you need for the lessons, so forth and so on. And all those materials are embedded on that website. So it's Sanford Harmony. And then uh, all they have to do is go in, sign up with an email address. And, and uh, that, like I said, that's free. Another free resource out there that is K through 12 is Overcoming Obstacles. And it is, there's, that, that one is uh, social emotional learning, plus it also teaches uh, communica communication skills, uh, goal setting, uh, things like that. And it is, it's a wonderful resource as well. It's all free. It tells you what you need to do. It gives you all the resources, all the materials, all the handouts, uh, you know, how long the lesson should take per class. Uh, so those are two free ones that I know of. So That's take great. advantage of those and, and, uh, and go on those websites and find them out. And, and, uh, like you said, I think they're on the holler site. Uh, there may be a link to one of them on a PowerPoint we did or something there. So first one was K through six Sanford harmony. And the second one was K through 12 overcoming obstacles. Doug, we use Sanford harmony on our, um, when we were doing NTI days, Yes, we did some choice boards from activities that were on there and our students really love those. So we have, we implemented that last year as a trial with one grade. Right. And so we've made a plan to implement that with all of our students next year. So that is a great resource for those that are elementary that have um, the K-6. So thank you for um, sharing that. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Doug. So, um, yeah, those, both of those resources are really good. So, the, actually, those three, so that Castle resource, um, and then that Sanford Harmony, and then that Overcoming Obstacles, all of those are, um, some of the, I guess they're ready, you know, teachers can use those. That would give them a tool, some tools for the toolbox to use for some strategies and some, and some supports that they could use. So, thank you all for sharing with that. Um, the next one, then, is around that high leverage practice number 10, and that is, um, around those three components, really understanding that ABC model for behavior and understanding that antecedent behavior and consequence. And so we, um, you know, develop understanding and developing a plan. And when we figure out what the function of a behavior is, you know, sometimes a student may have a behavior as an avoidance, you know, it's so the antecedent, you know, is they want to, um, there's a, a task that maybe they cannot complete. So then they, they have a disruptive behavior so that they're removed from the classroom. But helping teachers to understand that cycle and understanding that ABC model and that helping, so special educators then look at that function of the behavior. And then that's how we develop those behavior support plans. And so the, the important thing about that one is that just understanding that process and knowing how to collect data on that. And especially if you are um, intervening with a behavior that, you know, you may have a more frequent occurrence before it diminishes as well. And, and just helping teachers really understand that cycle of that ABC model and how, when to give intervention or, or um, when to provide um, opportunities for intervention and how, and how to address those behaviors. 
Doug, do you have anything I could add on that slide? Uh, no, I think you covered it all. Just, just uh, you got to keep in mind though when you're when you're working on uh, behaviors and and trying to do a behavior plan or whatever, you always want to start with the behavior of concern, and then you look at what are some antecedents, what are some things or triggers that set that behavior off and then what are the consequences or how do you respond to that behavior and when you're identifying a behavior to work on as far as doing a behavior plan you have to make sure that that behavior is defined in a way that's measurable observable and objective we can all count how many times little johnny says a, a bad word we can uh, all agree on what that word is and that's not an, an appropriate use of that word and it has to be something that uh, someone as a stranger can walk into that classroom and observe that kid and say, yes, that is the behavior of concern that we're looking for. So make sure you define those behaviors to the point where that is, there's no question that that's the behavior that's causing the difficulty in the classroom. And then the hardest part about doing an FBA or functional behavior assessment is gathering the data and the information from everyone that works with the little fellow with works with the kids. Uh, because a lot of times we leave that up to one person or one teacher to do that and a lot of times it's a special ed teacher and they only have them for maybe an hour hour and a half at the most a day so it's difficult for them to gather that information just themselves so it's, it's a team effort when you're doing an fba and a writing a behavior support plan so and then behavior support plans they're they're a lot, living document they can change because if you implement a, a strategy and it doesn't work and don't keep doing it try something new so just uh just keep that in mind so thank you thank you denny can you advance to the next slide okay so that kind of brings us to the end of the behavior and i think so far that discussion that you guys have contributed is certainly uh very beneficial is there anything else you want to talk about around behavior um before we move to uh talking about the instruction because again i know behavior is a hot topic and it's something that we really want to focus on Anybody have any other comments or questions? And really, if we think about that in terms of high leverage practices and, and what a special educator needs to do, we want to make sure that special ed teachers really understand this process and, and they have the resources and the tools they need to provide those interventions and supports for students. But you know, now, later today, Dion, we're gonna talk about uh, the manifestation determination and some of the legal aspects of, of, of discipline around uh, the behaviors that we see with students with uh, with disabilities so that that's coming up uh, this afternoon and and we'll, we'll dive deeper into um, some of the things that we've learned uh, around um, uh, what our responsibilities and our uh, legal um, authority is in in that uh, realm okay all right thank you Danny. uh so so the next 11 through 22 high leverage practices are all around instruction and so that's what i wanted to kind of spend the next little bit talking about is the instructional component of that so if you don't mind danny we'll go ahead and just advance to uh, high leverage practice number 11 and this one we're talking about prioritizing long short-term and long-term goals and the thing around this one is it's going to be critically important that um, we understand uh, now that we may have gaps in ins with instruction because we've missed, you know, how if students have missed some instruction been with the um, COVID, but not so not only are we going to have to look at that content, but we're also going to have to look at those IEP goals and think about um, how we're going to move students. So we're already challenged to think about when we write, when we think about a student with disability that we have to expose them to grade level uh, content. But we also have to be able to look at that content and discern what are those critical components of that standard or that um, that academic uh, target, and how do we backward design that to meet students where they're at? So you may have a fourth grade standard and a student that's reading on a first grade level. So we already have to figure out how we're going to prioritize what that skill is, and that's that's going to be something that's going to be even more important now. Uh, in the in the current situation and so how do we do that and so teachers might need some support and some coaching around that because if you think about in terms of reading you may get a, um, a diagnostic report back that gives a report on a student about their reading they may be reading on um, 
grade 2.1 and they have a specific learning disability in reading and they're in the eighth grade. So we have to figure out how we're going to bridge those gaps as best that we can. And in a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable uh, goal for that student to work on. So we know that students are still going to be assessed if they're in the eighth grade at that eighth grade level. So we have to really be able to pull that critical content out. And that's what makes it uh, so difficult and in for uh, for special education is you really have to go back and look at that you can use that uh, you could use the um, the progressions with the standard and think about it in that way but we also have teachers need those uh, to be able to use screeners um, other sources of data to really drill down and see if, if it's a reading comprehension deficit and we're just working on reading we're working on uh, fluency or vocabulary, but it's not, that's really not the deficit skill. We, if we don't, we don't know that unless we really drill down and use maybe a screener and figure out what that exact deficit is. And then we do some really explicit teaching on that. So this one is a big, um, a big priority is how do we figure out what that standard is and look at looking at that standard and then des backward design that to meet the need of that individual student and move them forward as far as we can. And so that's where we start that differentiation process. And, and so I think for special ed teachers, I tell them, you know, that using the progression document is a really good tool because we still are developing uh, standards based IEP goals and objectives. So we want them to not just copy and paste the standard, but we want to look at what skills are in, in that standard and then how to figure out what those skills are and then write their goals around those because that's what kids really need. And again, you may have 20 kids that have an, uh, that are students with disabilities that are on your caseload. And so that will be individualized for each of those 20 kids. Uh, the other thing is like you may have a student, we identify kids sometimes, uh, with a specific learning disability or they have a deficit in written expression. But do we really know what that deficit is? Is it in, is it in the writing process? Is it that they do not like, they have um, the deficit in the planning or the, you know, do they know how to plan or revise or edit? Is it, um, is it a deficit? Is it an error? So what we have to really know, so it's not just to say they have a deficit in written expression, but we need to know what is it in that writing process or, or in the pre-writing that the, the student would need in order for us to be able to design goals and objectives around that specific deficit in order to move that student. Again, if we're spending time working on in, in written expression and it's around planning and or pre-writing and we're working on written writing fluency, we're not getting at what they need to be getting at. And so teachers need some support with sometimes with that understanding, really drilling down to that um, really that skill deficit. And so that's again why that is a one of those high leverage practices is really finding tools. So it's kind of like teachers are going to have to have a toolbox full of tools that they can use for different areas. Like you would have some some specific strategies that you might use to teach phonemic awareness, or you might have some very specific skills that you use to teach fluency. And John O'Connor, who authored this book, um, Great Instruction, Great Achievement and it's the uh, roadmap for special education administrators. One of the things he talks about is we, that we have these toolboxes full of strategies for phonemic awareness, for vocabulary instruction, so that we know that these are, are um, high leverage practices that we know that help students the most. So we really know what those skills and strategies are to focus on. And then we, we use those for students so that we um, kind of build that build that box, that box of tools. Does anybody have any comments or questions about that? Or um, how do you think we're doing with, how do we think in terms of special education, do you think that uh, special ed teachers have tools and resources they need to be able to drill down to those skills? Uh, Dion, this is Lori Bricken, um, principal at Prestonsburg High School. And I just want to thank you for how succinctly you stated all of that, because this is something we really struggle with at uh, the high school level mm -hmm. because we have teachers that um, may not feel real confident in certain content areas, especially mm -hmm. science. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just thank you for clarifying that and um, appreciate that. And that is probably something at the high school level, especially in the science or um, 
maybe for us not as much in math areas, but I'm sure probably other schools it may be math areas. Uh, that 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 would help us if we had a little more support in those areas. Absolutely, absolutely, and it really is just looking at it's the same kind of the same kind of idea is that that backward design of looking at that that standard that science standard and and thinking about what is it what gaps do they have, and it could be you know. Uh, can they apply the scientific method or do they have a tool or a strategy that they can use? Um, they may a graphic organizer or, or what kind of supports might it be, but you're right. That if it, it could be a vocabulary also for, especially for students with disabilities because of the, the deficit that we have with vocabulary, you know, and they just getting access to that general ed curriculum. Uh, they can't always access it because they're hung up on the vocabulary and it may be something as pre-teaching the vocabulary and then using models and using visual supports and those kinds of things. But I think that's a very good point that uh, if, but if we know what to look for and then if we had a few tools that we knew were effective, then you could pull those tools out and run strategies out to work with students. Yeah. O'Connor talks a lot about having helping your uh, your special education teachers develop those preloaded uh, tool tools in their toolbox and um, being able to have a, a really strong conversation with parents if the parent were to come in and ask what is it that you're doing with my student that's so different what is special design instruction that you would have uh, good answers for that around uh, each particular student that you're working with Okay, so if you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's something we can certainly look at in terms of, and you really, that would help all students. That's not, not just our special ed students, but if you can really, you know, if you can really prioritize what those, those skills are, that helps all of our kids. Because we do have kids that, um, you know, that are, uh, they don't really meet that disability category, but they may have a, you know, they have a process and speed issue, or they have that IQ on the low end of that average IQ that really causes them to, to struggle through that content, but they don't have those services. So being able to prioritize those skills and then figuring out some strategies for that really would help all kids. Um, it would even help kids that, you know, that normally do okay, but they just, there's certain areas that they kind of get stuck on. So, but that's a good point. Denny, do you care to advance the slide for us, please? Uh, and so this one is, how do we do that a systematic? How do we systematically design that instruction toward that goal? And so again, that's, a, that's thinking about that in terms of that individual student goal, but we want to think about it so it's individualized, but we have to have a clear criteria for that. So we, if it's an IEP goal, we want to know exactly what does that mean to demonstrate mastery of that particular skill. And that may be that they, it's through, um, you know, that they model that through, you know, out of time trials or out of assessments. But uh, it's something that we identify very clear that this is what we want them to be able to do. And this is the criteria that says, yes, they've mastered it or they've not mastered it. And that's when it has to be an obse obse observable and measurable, and then it's a positive goal. It's, a, you know, what the student's gonna be able to do, but it has to be linked to that general curriculum. So we don't want to just a goal, um, like I said, we don't want just a, um, you know, if a student has a deficit in reading and we don't want just a vocabulary goal to be a vocabulary goal, but why do we need that vocabulary? Well, that vocabulary is gonna support that comprehension. And that's what we say with standard 10, that students are gonna read and comprehend text on their, grade level band with that complexity. So it, it, we want all of the goals that we're writing to be connected to something with that general curriculum. So if it's, you know, whatever it is that they're working on, if it's math, if it's science, if it's social studies, we want those goals to be applicable for those. Uh, so another thing, and this one is a real uh, kind of sometimes it's kind of an area where it's difficult to really understand the difference and, and teachers kind of get hung up sometimes, but how do we adapt our curriculum or our materials for a specific learning goal? And so sometimes we can adapt materials, but so if you look at that second bullet, we're talking about, we might adapt a task and that means that we might simplify a task or, or we might shorten the material or we might decrease the uh, difficulty level. If we do that, we don't want it to just stay at that simple, you know, that, that simplified means because we're never going to get kids to advance forward. So for instance, um, and we, I, I talked with another special ed teacher and, and she used this example. We were talking about if you, um, how we're teaching kids to 
use multiple choice questions and we might be start at the beginning of the year. We take away a couple of those choices and we let them, we teach them some strategies about discerning how to, to kind of figure out if you only have two choices, what the correct answer is. So maybe the first nine weeks you're working on that and you're teaching kids maybe just to be able to discern what the, how a strategy for, you know, choosing the right answer. But by Christmas, you're going to have, you know, two or th three choices or, or maybe in the, by the spring, you're going to have four choices, but that we don't, we always have to have a plan. Even for students with disabilities, we also always have to have a plan or how we're going to, re we're going to take away that adaptation or that modification so that we can get them to more independent level. Um, so by the end of the year, you don't want kids just having two choices because by the, you know, that's, it's not going to be that way. When you're assessed uh, later on, you're not, you're not going to have just two simplified versions of that. But that's one way we could scaffold that. To, so we start off, you know, providing them, but we're teaching them the strategies and the skills that they need. Then we add a little bit more and then we add a little bit more. But that's what that scaffold might look like. So when I say that about adapting the task, we just always have to have that in mind to think about we don't want to just leave it at that simple, that most simplistic level because we we do want to continue to challenge students and we want to, to have that expectation that student, students will achieve at the highest level that they can. Um, and then the other thing is around how do we work on the content? And so um, a scaffold that I use and have used in the past around like guided notes. So you have some kids who have a real deaf, just have trouble uh, even at the middle school and high school levels particularly, but they have trouble capturing notes or they're disorganized, or you may have kids who have an other health impairment that that's one of the, the um, attributes of that disability is that inability to organize their thinking. So guided notes might be a tool that you start out at the beginning of the year and you give them the notes and then you maybe just have them fill in the blank with a couple responses. Um, but you, you decrease that level of support and you give them, uh, as, as you go along, you're teaching them how to do the note taking, but then the next, the next nine weeks, you take away some of that, that support that you had in the guided notes, and then you leave them a little more responsibility. And so, and then the next time you give them that guided note framework, and then they start to capture those guided notes. And then by the end, then they, hopefully that they can capture those notes on their own independently. But so you can kind of see how that gradual release would be for some of those uh, adaptations. And that might also work for graphic organizers or using mnemonics, but we teach the kids the skills and the strategies. And they're gonna have to have lots of opportunity for practice and repetition and to do it over and over and over. And we have to model it and we may give them some guided notes and then we think they're doing okay and we take away some of those supports and then they and then we see that they're not ready for that. So we go back to that. But we, we continue to use those, but we always keep in mind that we don't we're always pushing that student forward with that expectation does anybody have any comments about that or, or thoughts about those I think it's just really important real quick to, to note that um, students with disabilities and students that have gaps in their learning uh, really lots of times struggle with organization they struggle with being able to reflect on what they've learned and just giving them all the tools that we can give to scaffold those um, those pursuits uh, can only make a, for a richer experience. And, and certainly um, we, we realize that students with disabilities have a real problem uh, in just thinking about their thinking and uh, really just really picking up on uh, how it all fits together and providing that context for them. So these things really help when it comes to that. I really love the way you set that up there, Dion. So um, if you don't care to, I guess we better pick up the speed here. Uh, and that leads us right to the high leverage practice number 14 is around that cognitive and metacognitive strategies. So the research tells us that kids, that students with disabilities really have a deficit in that metacognitive uh, processing. They really have trouble thinking about their own thinking. Because you'll think about a student that you've worked with, um, maybe that's doing a, a writing prompt. And they really lack that ability to plan out what they're going to pre-write. And then once they write something, they write it down, but they are not able to go back and, and edit it or review it or to go back because when they're done, they're done, right? So they, they have trouble thinking through that process. Same thing for comprehension, you know. They don't think about, did I did I understand this? Is there, you know, do I need to go back and reread it? Sometimes they have trouble with monitoring that. So that's why it's really important around those metacognitive strategies um, was that we just teach them some strategies 
we have to figure out what their need is, teach them a strategy, and we may have to teach that and reteach it and teach it again until they really get it. But we use those um, by doing, by describing what that tool is or that metacognitive strategy is. Um, and we model that. So we may have to model that for kids or special ed kid teachers are gonna have to model what that looks like for kids, kind of like a think aloud. And then we have to let them practice it and then we have to give them feedback and then we, and then we check to see, did they get it? And then, um, uh, and then uh, we have to see, uh, then can they generalize that? And that's another thing that kids have trouble with disabilities. So if you teach them to use a Freyer model uh, for vocabulary in reading. Can they use that Freyer model to understand and to work through vocabulary in science, in that content science vocabulary or social studies vocabulary? So that's where, um, you know, kids need some support thinking about their thinking, and that's when they we have to really model that. And that's one thing I think special ed teachers, uh, that would help support special ed teachers to help their own students is, always being cognizant of do we, how we model that, how we describe it, and then letting kids practice it. So I say that all the time, you know, you tell kids that you, I told you that, and I showed you how to do that, but did you, did we give kids an opportunity to, to use that strategy to practice it? If they messed up, do we go back and, and redirect that and teach that again? So um, that's all around that cognitive and metacognitive strategies. Let's see, Dan, if you won't care to click on. Um, and here is, again, those scaffolded supports. And that's really back to what we were talking about um, just a minute ago about how we provide those scaffolds and those supports for students. And that uh, as special education teachers, and we as we develop those goals, and then having an IEP team. But we develop those goals for students because we have this data that tells us this is what the kid needs to be working on. But how do we, we plan for those scaffolds? What do we need to do? It might be that we, um, we have to pre-teach the vocabulary or that we, um, we have to give them models or an example. So if you're talking about um, teaching something um, at the ocean, talking about the ocean, and you're teaching something around that, but a child has never seen that, that uh, they've never had that experience, they don't know what that looks like, how do we do some pre-planning for some scaffolding? Do we give them some, how do we build that background knowledge or how do we give them some contextual knowledge about that before we're teaching those things? So that's why the kids, our students with disabilities need those supports. And I think other kids, that benefits all kids as well. But then we, we use this explicit instruction model and that's the part about I do it and that's how we model it. And then we, we do it together and then you do it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next, a couple of high leverage practices. So Dean, if you don't care to, so, so this one is around high leverage practice number 16. It's the using the explicit instruction model. And you know, we all think about this, it's just good teaching. Um, we did some research on this and you know, this model has been around the, the explicit instruction model uh, in the seventies, but it's so particularly important for our students with disabilities because they need to see those, they, they need to see that modeling. And so you, they need to see examples and non-examples um, they need to see what that looks like. They need those visual supports. And then they need that scaffold, they structure when they give them some, we do guided practice, especially kids need a lot of opportunities for that guided practice. Uh, because what happens usually is in that part, you know, especially kids are not going to be jumping in there and answering questions, or they're not going to be engaged in that, in that, in that particular content because they maybe don't have a good understanding of it. So when we think about that, we, that's where we really have to engage those students with disabilities um, a lot in that practice sessions. And then we give them an opportunity to do it independently. And sometimes we have to go back and model it again. So that's very fluid between the I do it, we do it, you do it. Sometimes you think that they have it, and that, but then you have to go back and model it you know, seven more times again before they get that, pra you know, and give them some practice before they really get it through that explicit instruction model. Uh, and the other thing is thinking about grouping and how do we group kids? How do we group students um, and thinking if, if it's in a, uh, if there, it's in a collaborative classroom, how do we work with, uh, we divide kids into small groups or how do we, and that's what we're going to talk about. The next session is about co-teaching, but how can we use small groups for students um, so they can kind of, they go in and out of those groups or how do we use these mixed ability groups for students? and that we need flexible groups 
for our students sometimes, but it's really important that teachers understand. We don't want just special ed kids in the same group all the time, right? Because they're never going to see what an exemplar model looks like. And traditionally that's happened is we have, you know, the, a, a group of kids and then we have the, the special education group that works separately or at a table in the back of the room. And, and we don't really want that to happen for, to be the most effective for our students and, and, and even our, our gap students, because we, they need to see those exemplar models of what it looks like to do that from their peers. So helping teachers understand those flexible grouping and support that grouping that some, you know, you might have some kids that you have a small group that you're working on a specific skill. So it can be around a skill, not necessarily a grade level all the time, because they may have be working with a couple of different grade levels of kids. They may have kids in sixth, seventh and eighth grade, but, but if I'm teaching a skill, what kids need this specific skill instruction? Then if you don't care, please if you flip the next slide. And uh, so this one is around how do we get kids in that process while we're delivering that instruction to be active and engaged in the learning. Again, our special ed kids are not always engaged in that learning because so they're maybe misbehaving or they're doing something else because they are they can't understand, they don't have that content knowledge, they don't have that background knowledge, they don't have that vocabulary. So we want kids to be engaged. And so part of that work that uh, Dr. Anita Archer has done around explicit instruction, she really divides uh, the kinds of responses that kids have when we work with groups of kids into verbal, written, and action responses. And the theory behind that is that if we give kids, all kids an opportunity to respond, rather than calling on one kid or, or uh, you know, the kids that always answer the questions. If we give kids an opportunity to use like choral responses or uh, response cards, you know, it's like the ABCD cards they can hold up or, or whatever, or index cards or some that we make, but we give kids all kids. So I ask a question and then I have all kids hold up their response card at the same time. That holds those students with disabilities accountable. So it's a part of that accountability. They have to be accountable for that learning as well. So they can't opt out. So they don't have, they can't just necessarily sit back and wait for, for other students to answer the question. They're going to have to have some accountability as well. And the same thing with written responses, you know, teachers that use whiteboards or those dry erase boards, but have all students respond. And so that's one way that we can check for understanding for the whole group, but that's particularly, you know, we can use that as a progress monitoring tool for our students with disabilities. And a lot of times you'll find teachers that have trouble figuring out um, how do I progress monitor a student in, in if they're in the general ed setting. But this could be an opportunity. You could look at the number of trial responses and then they could record that, whether kids demonstrated mastery or not. And then another way to have kids respond is thinking about an action or movement or a way um, to uh, to model what they what they um, what they know. So those are all very helpful things to think about, and it gives kids other ways to respond rather than just the traditional raising your hand and answering the question. It just really changes shifts that accountability for the students. Um, to, to put some responsibility for their learning. So we have this thinking about what kind of assistive technology and instructional technologies that we have. We have this model, which is the universal design for learning. And this is how we embed uh, technology into our instruction. And so really that, and there's a link there. When you get this PowerPoint, you'll be able to link to this UDL, but it's around how do we use technology to increase the student's engagement and how do we use that in order to help them access content? It may be um, a reader or something that we use to let them access that grade level content. But what else, what kinds of technology do we use to let kids demonstrate their mastery? So, so thinking about the product that we have from assignments, can special ed kids sometimes create a PowerPoint or could they create um, a video response or could they audio record their responses uh, to questions? So this gives teachers just some ideas about how we can use those uh, technologies in the classroom to support students and give them a different modality for representing what they're, what they've learned. Dion, I was just going to say uh, really quickly, and I know we're running short on time, but um, you know, we appreciate everyone that's, that's uh, tuned in with us today. And, you know, when you think about universal design for learning, uh, you know, you want to front load that into your curriculum. You want to be thinking about, 
um, you know, using these technologies to increase the students' abilities to show and give them access uh, and make an equitable um, education for all uh, through this use. And one of the best analogies that I've ever heard about universal design for learning has to do with just simply, uh, uh, most of you probably at some point in your life have been bowling. And, um, you know, um, if you always bowl and you bowl the same way and you bowl a straight ball right down the middle and you do that every time, uh, you know, you're going to hit a few pins, but lots of times you're going to get a 7-10 split. And if you, that's the two pins in the very back that are going to still be standing. They're going to really be hard to pick up on, um, um, on a, uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, one, one more ball to, th to roll down the, the uh, lane. So uh, if you if you think in uh, about universal design for learning in this um, in this context or with this analogy, if you if you would learn to use that hook um, and, and throw the ball a little differently down the lane uh, and you're shooting to hit that 710 pin each time in in your um, attempts to hit the 710 pin, you're going to pick up those uh, students uh, right down the middle of the lane. And so if we'll, if we'll design our curriculum and design our uh, activities and our um, strategies around hitting those students that are most difficult to hit, uh, that 710 split in the classroom, then we're gonna pick up those guys right down the middle uh, residually. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and I heard that, I ran across that somewhere and I really loved it. Thank you, Dan. You advance our slide to the next one, please. And we're going to try to move on through these. Um, and so this one is just talking about um, high leverage practice number 20 is providing intensive instruction. And what we mean by that is that we're data-based individualization. So we look at the individual data um, for that particular student, and then we provide, we give that specific instruction. And what I was talking, for example, if we have a student that we, um, that has a, a phonemic we look at a student's reading deficit and they're not reading on grade level, but we drill down and we look at that student has a phonics. It's an issue with phonics. Maybe they don't have mastery of the 26 sounds, uh, 26 letters or 44 sounds. Then we can, we know exactly what to do to provide that instruction. We, we give that very intensive, explicit instruction on phonics. Um, and then we monitor them. And then we, we use that data to make a decision about that. And then we change our instruction based on what the data tells us about that. And so really, that's really what that practice is, is how we use that intensive instruction to support students. If you don't care, please, Danny, to advance that one. Um, and then the next thing is after we have that mastery for students uh, of some skills, then how do they generalize that? And so that's the thing. How do kids, if we have, if we teach a kid a skill, or a strategy, they can might use it in reading class, but can they apply that same skill or strategy to um, science or social studies? But also the same thing for behavior. If we teach a child that this is the way we behave in the classroom, this is our procedure for getting a pencil, or, or this is how we uh, model that we're on task, do they use that same generalized behavior in uh, across other settings? And then Danny, if you'll take us to high leverage practice number 22, this one uh, is around, this is the last practice, but it's around positive and constructive feedback. And so feedback is critical, and especially for our students with disabilities, but for all students, and even for us as adult learners, but uh, feedback is very, very important. And that we don't just, you know, give feedback um, with a check mark, yeah, you got it right, or, or, or no, you didn't, but it's very specific. Um, that you used, you did a good job with this three-step representation of how to solve this math problem. Um, so then that feedback very immediate, but those we know is a huge, huge um, re uh, support for advancing students with disabilities that they really need that feedback and that we um, give them immediate feedback so that they are, you know, if they maybe have a misunderstanding or misconception, then they can uh, make a correction on that. But we also have to think about that developmental level and what the, what's appropriate for that feedback for our students with disabilities. But if you'll click on one more slide over, um, we have a whole page with all of these resources around the academic components, all around the due process, all kinds of things around special ed that's new at the holler. 
and it's you can go on the holler.org and access all of those special education resources and those are all aligned to different components of those highly rich practices so uh,